afternoon, everybody. I think we're running a little bit behind, but that's okay. I would like to welcome you to our last session. Um, the first thing we're going to do is have some project updates, and these are shortly or uh, slightly longer form um, presentations, and we've got two of them for you today, which are both statewide significance. And then we will hear from our closing plenary speaker. So. Our first project update is from Greg Pilati, who is the Senior Director at the Archives, Special Collections, and Digital Curation of the Yukon. And he is going to bring us up to speed on the Connecticut Digital Archive. I 
I'm here today is to ask you to become interested in this. Um, and we're going to have four, uh, what I'm calling working groups, uh, one talking about the governance, one talking about access and use, uh, another talking about the content and scope, and then another about the technical infrastructure. Uh, these groups would be uh, manned by volunteers, uh, as well as a central um, governance group or, or management group that would oversee the whole project. And um, we would talk about the things we want to do and how we wanted to do them uh, and how we might make that happen. Um, the goal is to produce what I'm calling the organizational handbook that sets out the, um, the governance model and the uh, organization model of the Connecticut, Connecticut Digital Archive and a plan for implementation and a prototype infrastructure. Uh, we've already built at the University of Connecticut a repository framework foundation um, that I'll talk about actually a little bit later. Um, right now I want to give you an example, there's a little chart about what this could look like. Uh, the idea is that there's a, the central repository would be hosted at UConn, the technical infrastructure, very much like uh, Connecticut History Online, which has been hosted at UConn for more than 10 years. We would host the central infrastructure, but there would be a, uh, a governance group made up of some amount of participants based on whatever we think <laughs> over the next year, how we want to organize it. Um, individual organizations or groups of organizations would um, be able to deposit content in the repository and then um, use it and present it in any way they wish. So one of the ideas is that while there might be a Connecticut Digital Archive portal where you might get everything, that wouldn't necessarily be the only way and probably not the primary way people would interact with the content in the repository. People would interact with the, with the content in the repository based on tools and, and um, portals that were built by anyone interested or the member institutions or anything like that. Because again, following, and it was great, Trevor and I didn't organize our talks um, today, but he said some things I thought were really, really good. He said, Oh, yeah, this is not a solution, as he said. We want to build something that's a repository that maintains digital content over time, maintains its authenticity, right? It doesn't do everything, but it does that thing really well. And it makes it possible for you all to do all these other things that you want to do. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, another way to look at this is that uh, the CTDA is this layer at the bottom, what I like to call the foundation, and layered on top of this would be any number of management tools and presentation layers and things that connect people up there in the information universe to the content. But the thing that the CTDA does well is to manage this content in ways that makes it possible for it to be used and reused. Uh, we currently have uh, 10 organizations that have been involved in the NEH grant uh, application. Um, and they're listed here, and you, you probably uh, recognize a lot of them. Um, they were part of sort of this, um, this uh, what's, what's the word I want? Um, unofficial group of people that just happened to get together uh, based on, oh, I know somebody, I'll call them up, let's get them over here. <laughs> um, so what we're hoping to do now, of course, is to engage with many more people around the state. Uh, the goals of the project over the next year or so, build the organizational and technical infrastructure, identify our participants, create a pilot system with some early adopter collections. Um, over the next two to four years, and I'm sorry, these things take time. I know we all want this yesterday, if not the day before. Uh, it's not going to happen yesterday or the day before. It's not even going to happen today or tomorrow, but soon it will. Um, of course, securing permanent funding is important. Uh, and in the long term, we hope to preserve Connecticut digital culture for future generations. So I'm just asking you to join us <laughs> and um, tell us you're interested. We're putting together, if you send me an email, this email address, and say, hey, I'm interested. I want to know more about this. Sometime over this winter, when we start putting together our communications tool and our, and our mailing list to uh, get people involved, I'll come back to you and say, hey, you said you were interested. Now it's time to talk about it and to build this. So there we are, and that's where we're going. Thank you.
Connecticut History Online. No, ConnecticutHistory.org. I'm sorry, it's been a long day. But we are partners with Connecticut History Online, and proudly so. All right. Seglio, and I'm a research associate with the Center for History and New Media at George Mason University, and also part of the editorial team for ConnecticutHistory.org, which is a project of Connecticut Humanities. And I'm lucky to have a lot of colleagues with me today. We have Tom Scheinfeld, the project director, and we also have Amy, Kim, and Greg, who work on the editorial as well as the technical sides and they're interspersed and only Kim is the one that I can see right now. What I want to do today rather than take you on a forced march through the site is to answer some important questions about ConnecticutHistory.org. What is it? What does it do? And why does this matter for you, your institutions, and the publics that you serve? Let me get a sense of how many here within their institutions have collections, whether they're uh, digitized or not. How many of you have collections that you want the public to be able to connect with and access in some way? <laughs> All right. How many of you think that too many public members know about you already? How many, oh, all right, <laughs> I paid him 10 cents to, to add a little humor to the top. Uh, how many of you are confident that everyone you would like to reach is already finding your website? And if they find your website, do they know where to find some of your deeper uh, layers of information? And that is our common problem here in the state of Connecticut. We are richly blessed with a lot of state-related content and history. But it's not always easy to get to. And so what Connecticut Humanities, I'm sorry, Connecticut Humanities through its ConnecticutHistory.org project aspires to do is to be the first stop, a curated, selection of materials that is story driven that ultimately the purpose of is to drive the explorers who find topics, events of interest to them on our site back out to you, back out to your archives, back out to where this material is held. And so for example, going back to our website, I said story driven. This is a public history project, and we know that many people are interested in the town they live in, hence they can come in through that access gate. Perhaps there's a particular topic, native histories, women's history, labor, disasters, that's extremely popular, that they wish to know about people. They can enter the site in any number of ways. Each month we have featured articles in the banner, and every single day, believe it or not, we are adding, oh, sorry, I'm not a Mac person, where did my, my scroll bar go? And what, yeah. Did you just, just you use the trackpad?
context. So I think, uh, as Greg was emphasizing, connecting con content to people, part of what we're doing is providing context for that content. <coughs> One of the, sorry, I'm getting a little bit. You have a blog, we pick up live feeds on the home page every day. And we will take readers back out to your what's new in the archives, what's going on behind the scenes at the state library. We are also aggregating that. So back to the idea of pulling together content from reliable, trustworthy sources and sending the public back out to that material. How we're adding content to the site is through cooperation and collaboration. Cooperation is as simple as Christine calling us and saying, I saw that you have an entry on your site about Young Wing. We just finished digitizing his diary. Here's the link. Can you add it to your resources for that article? Absolutely. Collaboration is a little deeper. That's where we sit down with, say, for example, the Lebanon Historical Society. And we talk about a current exhibit that they had up that once it's done, it's done. The wonderful material that it had on the role of music as a community builder in Lebanon in the 1800s goes into the files, never to be seen. They don't have the capacity to host that information. So to keep that scholarship out in the public eye and to let the public know what the Lebanon Historical Society still maintains in its collections related to this interesting story. We worked with them in their exhibition script to pull together that context, the history that went with the photographs and other material that they have. Collaborations can be a little more complex. We're working this year with the Connecticut League of History Organizations and also History Day in Connecticut to put together a list of turning point topics. That is the year's theme, and this year the group is really trying to encourage educators and students to use local history, state history, as the lens through which to explore national topics and national themes. And so working, we put out a survey with the Connecticut League of History Organizations to ask folks, what are the turning point topics that you hold in your collections? from your town that students might want to use for their projects. <clears throat> What's next? First, I want to emphasize that the site is evolving. When you go to the site and you search for a topic near and dear to your heart because it's in your collections and you don't find it on our site, that is an opportunity to call us and say, hey, We've got this great material, we have these great stories and these objects and items to support that story. We'd like to work with you to help get that history out to a broader public. So part of what's next is working with you to continue to expand the history that we're telling. And it is an ongoing, evolving task. Some of the things that are in the work, some of them are at the noodling around stage, some of them are much further advanced. Uh, teach It, we'll be adding a new section. We've been working with social studies educators right now at the eighth grade level to put together, not curricula, but modules so that again, they can tell the natural, national, and I guess natural if they feel like it, the national history that is mandated as part of their curriculum for the year through the local lens. So Forget about the Boston Tea Party. Forget about the ride of Paul Revere. We have Connecticut is still revolutionary stories on our side. Stay <laughs> plug there, all right. Fund us, no. Um, Connecticut Communities is a mobile app that is in its uh, very early stages. So again, uh, knowing that part of the magic of history is being in the place, how can we bring place-based history to users on the spot. And then I won't go too much into the Native Histories Initiative. I spoke about that a little bit this morning. But it's an open conversation group, and I would love to hear from folks who have materials in their archives 
uh, related to that topic. And uh, we welcome you to get in touch and to help you remember our URL, which is also our name, I'll be like Oprah and I will hand out free gifts to the audience. <laughs>
And given the choice, society always chooses an environment that is, that is more convenient than permanent. Okay, and this chart, uh, some years ago, this uh, Paul Conway put together this chart. We would call it a data visualization now, but he called it a chart. Um, that he called the dilemma of modern media. And this was done before there were cell phone cameras and smartphones um, and Facebook. And he shows an inverse relationship between information density and the longevity of that media. Um, and we can see that papyrus replaces clay tablets and scrolls replace papyrus and the codex, codex, which of course was the first random access, access memory device, uh, we call it a book, um, replaces the scroll onward through movable type, wood pulp paper, newsprint, microfilm, compact disks, and other optical media. And by extension, beyond this chart, cloud services that are nearly ubiquitous <coughs> today. As we see in the graph, though, by as early as the 19th century, the medium of the historical record began to become as much a problem and an issue as the contents of that record itself. As long as history was recorded in scratch marks on a physical medium, or to a lesser extent photographs on glass or film, it was not only permanent, but interpretable to the human eye. Once coded information began to, began to replace physically recorded information, the whole landscape begins to change. Information transfer that requires an intervening technology, whether it be a human telegraph operator or an optical drive, becomes inaccessible to the average human without a reading device. Okay? And this is a really key element, and it's been happening for a long time. We just haven't really noticed it. Um, um, this occurs as, uh, perhaps as early as the telegraph, and certainly in popular culture by the time of the wax cylinder. I can't look at this wax cylinder and read the words on it. It's a spoken word um, wax cylinder. Uh, but even this wax cylinder, or a flat LP disc, contain an analog representation of the sound waves. So it still is the sounds themselves, but it still requires an intervening technology. The advent of magnetic, optical, and digital media further changes our landscape, and even the written word is now subject to an intervening technology. And the permanence of our documentary record is subject only to the vagaries not only to the vagaries of temperature and humidity, but also much more to the marketplace of technology. By the 1970s, oh, <laughs> yeah, you like some of it? <laughs> and and who, knows, who knows that VHS tape on the top left? Right? That was the cultural Armageddon of the 1970s and 80s, when all of our uh, cultural heritage was going to burn up into the slow fire of acidic paper and nasty acidification projects were going to save uh, uh, human culture. Anybody participate in the nasty acidification project? <laughs> um, um, whoops. Sorry, I walked by. Yeah. Uh, by the 1970s, typewriters began to give way to word processors, film to videotape, and then digital recording to the and then to digital recording. And the historical record became really dependent upon the medium of recording more than it ever had been before. Um, by the 1990s, we're looking at a cultural Armageddon of media obsolescence. And uh, we're trying to figure out how to manage and maintain multiple recording media. Uh, something Trevor said earlier today was, if you get something in in any of this, get it off as fast as you can. And uh, we've, we've learned to do that. And so this cultural Armageddon of the 1990s uh, is not quite so worrisome now, because we know a simple thing, get it off the medium. However, we now face a new cultural Armageddon of the 2000s. Um, um, by the turn of this current century, there are fears that the ephemerality of not just the media, but of digital file formats would lead to a new digital dark age, when the inability of modern equipment to read old file formats. And everybody heard the story, oh no, I can't read my, what was that word processor? Data star, what? Word star. Word star, word star. Word star. oh word yeah, word star. star. The millions and millions of word star files. Well, okay, first of all, there weren't millions and millions of word star files. Most of them
of the words star piles weren't worth saving anyway. And anybody who wrote in word star printed it out. And what we've been doing lately actually is what, what I like to call reborn digital, where we are turning things that were originally created in digital format, printed to paper, and now we're scanning them, we're turning it into reborn digital. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we're archivists and that's kind of what we do. <laughs> um, Thanks, though, to the work of archivists and computer science and librarians and many others, these fears were shown to be largely unfounded. Um, file format obsolescence, while it was really something people worried about, hasn't happened so much. File formats haven't gone obsolete very often. And when they have, there's always been some way to convert. Now, a good rule of thumb, and I think Trevor talked about this, but if he didn't, he should have. He says, if you're going to store digital information in any particular file format, make sure you choose a file format that, I think he said it was open, and has uh, a large penetration in the marketplace. So, right, don't make WordStar your archival file format of choice. Right? <laughs> and um, I'm not even going to get into the whole Microsoft Word open office thing. So, um, anyway, um, the fears of digital dark ages continue to persist in the popular press, but really the we still continue to lose a historical record for much more traditional means. Things like natural disasters, social collapse, uh, media, media obsolescence, much less. File format obsolescence, much less. No, the new cultural Armageddon, the one that's going to destroy us all now, uh, is not the lack of information, but the explosion of it. Uh, this, this chart is from the uh, Washington Post recently, and it was um, based on some work done a few years ago at um, University of Southern California. Um, the BBC estimated that by 2007, 94% of all stored information was stored in digital form. And the total amount of stored information at that time in 2007 was 295 exabytes. For those of you scoring at home, an exabyte is one billion gigabytes, or 10 followed by 18 zeros. Right? That's a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, in the sense of information management, we have truly crossed the digital divide, and there's no going back. I think there's one thing that we really, well, there's a number of things we can take away from this chart, but one thing we really should understand from this chart is that if we are not prepared and able to manage the digital record, then we're going to miss over 90% of the potentially historically valuable information that's out there. Um, and that is scary. But I have to tell you that I'm not worried about it. And I'll tell you why as we go along. Uh, because we're archivists. <laughs> I think the way forward is becoming clearer and something we've learned over the last half century or so of dealing with media. Rather than developing strategies for managing different material types, carrier media, and finally file formats, we're beginning to think in terms of separating the informational content of the material we store from the medium and it, that we store it on and from the medium in which we deliver it. Right? And again, Trevor talked about this a lot, and there's been a lot of talk about this today, about how our content needs to be separated from the way we store it and the way we deliver it. And it can be delivered in multiple ways, in multiple venues. And that's a good thing. Um, early in my career, because I, I became an archivist before the digital age, actually I spent a lot of time when in, in archive school talking about learning about original Original, uh, originality and uh, trying to find what they call the ribbon copy. Anybody know what a ribbon copy is? Right? <laughs> the ribbon copy is the sheet of paper where the typewriter ribbon actually hit, and it's not the carbon paper copy. No. The ribbon copy was the original. If you had the ribbon copy, you had the original. <laughs> Today, the concept of originality is much less clear as every copy of a digital file 
is in some respects is an identical twin of any other copy. And the viewing experience of anyone interacting with that information in a digital file is dependent not only on the characteristics of the file itself, but on the viewing environment of any one particular user. So you can't say necessarily that this is the original version of this sign. Because when I load this file up on my iPhone, it looks one way. The information comes to me, but it may be presented a little bit differently. Or on my iPad, or on my all those other devices we talked about today. So the originality and the, the authenticity of digital objects is based on their content and not necessarily the experience you have in using them. And that's a huge change. Um, as the cultural record turns from objects into data, file formats and carrier media become less central to our thinking. And managing data in any form becomes our goal. And we need to keep up with the current creators of content, who, of course, as we know, will create content in any way they want. It doesn't matter what we think is good. They'll just do it however we want. Um, some time ago, I was with my, and I always try to put my daughter in every uh, presentation I give. We were at a pumpkin festival, and we ran into a friend of hers from her school. And I'm, I'm going around, I think I'm really modern because I like have a digital camera and I'm taking pictures. And I, I see my daughter's friend's father walking around with his phone in front of him all the time. I said, oh, what are you doing? He said, well, you know, we don't take pictures anymore. I only shoot video. And we don't even use a camera nowadays. And I, I didn't tell him that like he was, in fact, using a camera. <laughs> <laughs> obsolete is like a daguerreotype or something like that. <laughs> the, the, the snapshot of the 21st century is the smartphone video. Right? And, it, and we're going to be, I don't know how many people have gotten smartphone video in their uh, collections yet. We haven't had any. You, you've got some? No. Well, not, no. No. <laughs> but, you know, you're going to. Right? Uh, and it's up to us really to understand how to manage that data in, in any form. Um, You know, the question that we have to ask is, how can we manage this flood of information? And the transformation of information into data is really the challenge of our current age. And if anybody's heard me speak before, you've seen this, um, seen this phrase. I like to say that preserving digital collections is the same as preserving physical collections, except where it's different. <laughs> and I think it's really true. Every time I try to explain why the digital world is different, I always come back to, but wait, that's what we've always done. But wait, that's what we've always done. And I think it's really important that we remember that, that as archivists, as librarians, as museum people, as keepers of cultural heritage, all right, we have to, and it's a good thing, to respect the principles of our, principles of our profession, but embrace the technology and the potential of technology, so much of it that we've seen today. So it's the same as it always been, except where it's different. Um, as technology is involved, archivists have always developed new ways to appraise and collect and manage digital content. And there will always be times when these, seems, these things seem to be out of sync, when new formats evolve faster than our ability to manage them. In these times, there's disruption, sure, in both the profession and in the historical record, until we can bring these things back into balance. And in the meantime, perhaps more of the historical record will, will be lost than would have otherwise, than would have been otherwise. But that's just the fact of historical documentation, and it's something we can't change. When I was in archive school, my archives professor um, used to say that if, if, as an archivist, you ever thought about how much you were losing instead of how much you were saving, you'd have to quit because it would be too depressing. <laughs> and I said. Yeah, let's just concentrate on the positive, on the things we're saving, and the things we can do to document the historical record. Because we, it will always be lost. It will always be ephemeral. But we shouldn't worry about that. <laughs> um, as 
with everything these days, these cycles of balance and imbalance seem to uh, be occurring with greater frequency. But you know, we'll solve the current dilemma and the current imbalance um, as we've solved the imbalances of the past. And a new equilibrium will be achieved until the next disruptive technology or disruptive thing upsets that balance. But that's OK. Um, I'd like to talk about a couple of things that I've observed recently and actually very much so here today. I'll call them the five equations of the cultural record. And I think it ties into not just the evolution and content creation, but also changing attitudes toward research. We've seen today many examples of how researchers and archivists are applying sophisticated tools and applications to digital objects that are seen as pieces of data. Okay, and, and by data we mean things that can be manipulated uh, and used in an electronic environment. This includes metadata, of course, which is just the sum total of everything we know about things, as well as digital objects themselves, which are by their very nature, by binary nature, are data. Okay? So just having digitized and digital collections isn't really enough. If it's not easily discoverable, if it's not, first of all, if it's not digitized, it really doesn't exist. And I know people say, oh, that's not really true, that's not really true. But it's starting to be true. Like I said, we've processed digital divide. 94% of all content that's being created today is in digital format. The expectation of people is that everything's in digital format. That's a challenge for us, who are the stewards of massive amounts of analog. All right, and it's up to us to find some way to bring that to people to where they are, and where they are is the digital world. Um, beyond the idea that if it isn't digital, it doesn't exist, we move to the idea that it, if it isn't reusable and recontextualizable and re anythingable, okay, it's not valuable. And our collections live, whether we like it or not, in a value market. We have to prove every day that our Work is valuable, and by valuable, how many times is it used? Who uses it? How is it used? Uh, how many of you have gotten those questions asked you all the time, right? Well, who goes into the archives anyway, right? Well, we have to show that people use it, okay? And it will be used if it has value, and it, it will have value if it's reusable. Um, combining our collections into aggregations of data that can be manipulated, used, and reused without losing their authenticity is one way to transform our digital objects into useful and valuable data. And as we've seen today, visualizations are the modern way that people tell stories. And are not that different from traditional storytelling. If primary sources are the raw material of storytelling, our primary sources then must support this modern idea of visualization and become data itself, themselves. Um, as we've seen, the humanities community has embraced digital scholarship, and like any scholarship, digital humanities scholarship is dependent on the availability of resources. We know that today's resources require not only an intervening technology to experience, but an intervening technology infrastructure, or what's become called a cyber infrastructure. How many people are familiar with the phrase cyber infrastructure? Right? The idea of cyber infrastructure is not just that there's a network or some place to save my files, but there's a system that, I, that enables me to manipulate, interact with, and use the material for my research. So we need to become part of a cyber infrastructure that allows people to use, manage, discover, and reuse digital content. This comes from the uh, American Council of Learned Societies, the Mission on Cyber Infrastructure for the Humanities. The word cyber infrastructure was coined actually by the NSF about 10 years ago, only 10 years ago. Of course, that's like, we were talking about a few minutes ago, that's like two generations in internet time. But, um, uh, you know, this, this, this is basically um, what they're saying, that cultural heritage resources are fundamental. Well, that's good because we think they are, right? But they must be combined with computer networks to make it possible for people, for scholars to discover and make sense of the human record. Um, collaborating with our partners
employers, the people who use our resources uh, on what I call the other side of the reference desk, uh, is a way for help for us to know how people want to tell stories in the current modern age and help develop our resources to support that kind of storytelling. Because again, only material that is used becomes valuable and only things that are valuable are preserved. remain the same, even if our tools are changing. Right now, these tools mean systems that can support preservation activities like error checking and uh, avoiding bit rot and all these sort of technical, that's a real high technical term, uh, redundant multiple storage, automated extraction of metadata, all these kinds of highly technical things that archivists didn't used to have to know about and maybe still don't need to know about if we can partner with the right people the people who can build systems, and build systems for us and with us. Um, creating and maintaining systems to preserve digital assets is expensive, and it's usually beyond the reach of all but the largest organizations. Uh, we heard a little bit again this morning about TRAC, Trusted Repository Audit Checklist, how it had all those highly detailed things. It's a big document. It's very difficult to become TRAC certified. Only a very few organizations in the world so far have been certified as track compliant, trustworthy, repository compliant. It's expensive. However, in aggregate, the so-called long tail of small and medium organizations probably contains more historical content than all but the very biggest collections. So how can we bring this long tail of small content into the world of digital preservation that is part of the economics of only large-scale organizations. Well, I talked a little bit about how we might be able to do that in Connecticut a few minutes ago. Uh, if we can collaborate to build a cyber infrastructure for digital culture in Connecticut, we'll accomplish a number of things together that we couldn't possibly do alone, even in a big place like the State Library, even in a big place like UConn, because we don't hold all the content. All the content's out there among everyone. We can support sustainability for di of digital assets for everyone. We can create a coherent, that's a really good word, coherent and managed digital collections that are comprehensive rather than merely exemplary. Um, I, I'm sorry Trevor's not here. He, he said something earlier today that I didn't, I didn't really agree with. Um, I think it's really important for us to comprehensively digitize our material rather than just pull out the treasures because scholarship is based on comprehensive um, study of as much stuff as you can find. Now we can spend more time with things that are more important and valuable, but we shouldn't ignore the things that we don't necessarily believe are treasures of our collections. Because in aggregate, our collections are highly valuable if we can have access to all of them. And that gets into this whole idea of how much metadata do you do, you do? how much work is good enough, how high a, a, a digitization standard is good enough, right? And all these things are questions that we need to answer both for ourselves individually and for the profession as a whole. So for years, the tradition has been digitize at really high quality, do the treasures, right? And what we've been seeing lately is, and, and do extensive metadata, what we've been seeing lately is digitize it, throw it out there as fast as you can, and let the expert enthusiasts out there tell you what this stuff is. Right? And that's starting to be a new model of letting go of our content. We're the stewards of the content, but we're not, we need to let go of it and get it out there and let people find it. Right? And having a central aggregation of this content helps people find it in places that they would never go to. Um, so contributing to a content aggregator like the CTDA would make it possible to connect even to even larger aggregations like the Digital Public Library of America. Is anyone, are you all familiar with the, D, the DPLA? It's a, 
It's a national project to um, bring together digital content from across America. Now, one of the things they're doing, they're not going to go talk to every single historical society in the country. They know they can't do it. They're looking for regional and statewide aggregators to aggregate that content first and then contribute it. We've had preliminary talks with the, DP, with the folks at the DPLA about making the CTDA, CTDA a node in the DPLA. All right? And that will be a few years um, in the making. But you know, we're on that road of connecting everyone's content, not only with Connecticut, but with the country and the world. Um, by doing these things, we will support the many shiny things we've seen today and the many, many more shiny things that we haven't even dreamed of yet. All of them are supported by a forward-thinking approach to digital assets that embraces the potential of technology, yet respects the traditions of our profession. So collaborative digi digital preservation works to sustain Con Connecticut's digital cultural heritage because it makes it possible for each organization to prove its worth individually and sustain its own collections, yet create something greater than the sum of all of its parts. Secondarily, and perhaps more importantly, in a larger sense, it supports this community of knowledge that's larger than any one organization could possibly be. So today I'm really here to give you a call to action, and I'm going to give you this slide again. <laughs> I want you, we want you, um, I really want you to consider joining the effort to create a sustainable digital cultural heritage for Connecticut and do donate not only your time, uh, but your content as well. And I know this is kind of scary, all right, because um, a lot of organizations, and UConn's one of them, that sees its content as the thing that makes it valuable and unique. And if I give it away, then what good am I if I've given it away? All right? we, have to, we have to learn that by giving it away, we get it back much more so. That by putting it out there and having people comment on it and add to it and connect it with other things that you might not even know existed, that your collections become more valuable. And you can point, you can point your funders to that and say, look, we're part of this, this great visualization that Clarissa has about ConnecticutHistory.org. Or, oh, look, it's on the streets that Jack Doherty's got in his little thing, right? And <laughs> you don't even have to know that Jack exists because Jack can find it in the, in the Connecticut archive and put it there and, and attribute it to you and link it back to your historical society or library or archives or gallery or anything. And it all becomes this giant web. <laughs> a worldwide web <laughs> of knowledge. <laughs> Am I the first one ever to say that? <laughs> so we have the opportunity today to do something that many of us in this room have dreamed about. The reality, of course, will be imperfect. The details will be messy, and progress will seem glacial at times. As an archivist, I see that as the normal course of events. <laughs> but I think it's something that we can do and that we will do. From the first archives of clay tablets to the digital repositories of the future, we're, take, we're, we're part of a long and respected tradition. We've solved so many other challenges of preserving and making available of the historical record. This is just the next one, and it's the one we've been given in our lifetime to solve. And I think it's something that we can do if we all work together. So I hope you'll join us, keep in touch, Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions about anything. Because <laughs> I can talk about anything. I don't know if I know it about it. <laughs> yeah? What do you think about the importance of digital objects to identify as DLI systems and as an insurance that stuff is still there? Yeah, uh, the question was, uh, what about digital object identifiers, or uh, also known as handles? Uh, I, they're absolutely essential. Um, we don't have a scholarly record without permanent, persistent identifiers. I, I, there are a number of slides that I didn't put in here. Uh, one was about six slides where I would click on a link and you'd get a 404 error that said, oops, 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 okay. That's, that's not good. Um, 
in order for a digital repository to be certified as trustworthy, it has to create for every object in it a, a permanent URL, a permanent identifier that's not dependent upon a server, so that it's like a digital object identifier. It's a string that, the way DOIs work is that they get a unique string that when you click on it, goes to essentially like a link resolver like handle.net, which is run by an international consortium. Right? And if handle.net goes away, we've got more to worry about than my link not working. Um, and then we would join handle.net, we'd get a unique ID, and then it would resolve back to whatever was in the repository. So uh, persistent identifiers, persistent permanent unique identifiers are the essential piece of preserving digital content and making it trustworthy and authentic. Yeah, and the, the CTDA will be built on um, persistent identifiers for all content. Yeah, that's a really technical question. <laughs> Something else? Well, that's how you can get a hold of me. Uh, please write in. Like I said earlier, we will be compiling a list of people who want to participate. Uh, Starting this winter, probably around January, we'll start gearing up the, um, the investigative process of building this collaborative digital repository for the state of Connecticut. And I hope you'll join us. Christine. And that concludes this year's Connecticut Forum on Digital Initiatives. I thank you all so much for coming and making this a fantastic day. I keep hearing from everyone how many connections they've made, and that's what today is all about. So I encourage you to go out there, collaborate. That's the way we get all of this content out there and ready for the digital archive, and get it out to the public and start getting the public engaged with what we're doing. So drive safely. I will be emailing links out tomorrow to uh, the, the document that we've got going that's full of links and, and a, cert, a conference evaluation form for your overall view of the conference, give you a day to kind of let it set and think about it. And with that, unless Ken has any closing words, thank you for coming. Thank <laughs> you.